Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast, coming to you live on a Saturday morning with a quad box. Uh, we are a few days away from free agency, so we decided to uh, bring in the big guns today, the the two Alexes. Uh, it was also Alex Insdorf's birthday this week, so Alex, happy birthday. Hopefully you had a great time celebrating down there in a foreign country, but uh, how are you doing today, man? Thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Um, it's sad to announce that my day, my dreams of being a day three running back probably <laughs> are are not coming to fruition. Uh, and I'm probably as washed as Blake Corum, unfortunately. So, but I'm happy to be on the show. Uh, and we'll talk, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the running back position today. Yeah. Yeah. Excited to, to get some thoughts here about uh, free agency from all the guys here. Alex Katzen as well is joining us uh, fresh off his week at the combine where he absolutely crushed it and uh it was your your first combine so alex how was the how was the trip man yeah it was great um i'm exhausted still uh like a week <laughs> after getting back uh it's a, it's a long week in indianapolis but it was a lot of fun um heard a lot of great stuff uh met a lot of great people you know got to uh got to experience everything that indianapolis had to offer had a really great time um and uh excited to be back home and excited for uh, free agency to get started it was really funny listening to all the podcasts uh, and like throughout the week, they got progressively like less enthusiastic and less energy, <laughs> and, you know, the voice is gone. So it was, it was a good time. I think you successfully maneuvered your way through the, through the whole week and uh, we appreciated your coverage for sure. All right. Tyler's here as well, man. Tyler, what's up? How are you doing today? Pretty good. Let's start this show. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are going to take questions. Uh, this is specifically geared towards free agency, but uh, you know, with Alex Katz in here, you know, our draft expert. If you have some draft questions, um, you can fire away there as well. Uh, Super chats will obviously ensure that your question gets uh, answered, but uh, obviously not necessary. But greatly appreciated. Uh, to get the brawl, to get the ball rolling, excuse me, uh, this morning, we're going to each be giving our three favorite free agent targets. So there's no real criteria here. Tyler and I did a show of like the, the options at $10 million or less. If one of you guys wants to really advocate for, you know, an expensive corner or something like that, I totally get it. So no real criteria, uh, three favorite free agents, just uh, it can be any position, anything like that. Um, Alex Katzen, why don't you uh, kick us off there? Yeah, um, I'm going to start with uh, with a fellow UW Husky, um, and that's Will Disley from the Seahawks, um, tight end. Uh, just got cut uh, earlier this week, which means he doesn't factor into the compensatory pick formula, um, which is going to be a huge thing for Joe Ortiz. Um, obviously, he's a great run blocker. All the tight ends up in Seattle are great run blockers. Um, and so, you know, any of the three of them that are free agents this season are going to be great options. Um, but Disley's uh, the best bet for my money just because again of the compensatory pick formula thing um i also think uh arthur mallette from the ravens uh the corner from the ravens uh he's going to be more of a slot guy but he has familiarity with jesse Minter's defense um the defense that the ravens ran last season um with mike mcdonald is similar um but not exactly the same as the defense that the chargers are going to run next season um obviously has the familiarity with hortiz uh coming from the ravens as well um and then the last one uh is brian allen the center from the rams uh, who got cut uh, a couple weeks ago um didn't uh, lost his starting job to Coleman Shelton, uh, who's going to be a pending free agent as well, but the Rams are going to try to bring him back. He's probably going to be out of the Chargers price range. Um, Allen is someone that you can probably bring in as like a, a veteran who's going to quote unquote compete for the starting job with a potential rookie pick, um, probably ends up starting, um, for a few weeks, um, if not the whole season next year, um, but can be probably had, uh, for cheap because he hasn't started since 2022 um but still has a little bit left in the tank um i think he's only 28 uh yeah 28 um so those are my three yeah uh, good good selection there of players who uh were formerly cut just to clarify that um because i know there's been some confusion about compensatory picks so it's about you know uh money going out versus money coming in uh players who are cut from their previous teams as daniel popper referred to them today are, are street free agents those players do not count against the compensatory pick formula. So for Joe Ortiz, if he really wants to make sure he gets a compensatory pick for Austin Eckler, Joe Darvitt, Aloe Gilman apparently has a big market. So if he wants to let those guys walk and ensure that they get some compensatory picks, the the players who were currently released from their teams, uh, those are kind of the players that you're 
looking at there. Tyler, your uh, your thoughts on Alex's three, and then why don't you give your your top three? Yeah, really like them. As he mentioned, the the tight ends from Seattle are all great and all good blockers and all good parts of really good scheme. So totally on board with that overall. Did not consider Mullet before. I think we had talked about corners, but it's more like um, Rock Yasin and some of the other DBs from the Ravens. So hmm. good call there for sure. Uh, my three, I guess I'll steal them because I think Steven already talked about them on the Chargers channel. So I'll just kind of revert back to some of these. Uh, Colby Parkinson, of course, I have to mention him because it's been a three-year thing for me. It's almost... Hassan Reddick or, or Cordero Patterson for us. Yeah. We're asking for it. We got a shot. Colby Parkinson there. A lot of NFL teams are really making it clear that this tight end class isn't great. Some guys are being brought back very early. There are new deals for I think three or four tight ends now being brought back before the market hits because it is it's not a great tight end class. And if you believe the charges are taking a tight end a tight end at five, that's it for the rest of the way. Basically, I like Theo Johnson, but it's just different. So Colby Parkinson get a tight end early. Walk into the draft happy. Um, I'll go with Tiari Tart. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but formerly of the Titans. Not a rusher, and that's totally fine. Uh, nose tackle, zero, one tech kind of guy who's going to plug the run. It costs um, $7 million APY um, for a three-year deal, according to Pro Football Focus's uh, free agent rankings. So I'd go with him. And I'm still going to ride the Derrick Henry train, guys. Like It's so unlike me to go with that direction. He's yeah. now expected a million dollar less, by the way. So, hey. We're buying low here. It was $10 million. Now it's nine. I'm I'm buying it. I really just feel like in any other system, different time, different coach, different coordinator, I don't think you're really looking at Derrick Henry. And frankly, maybe they aren't looking at Derrick Henry. But I just feel like with this particular Harbaugh, Roman sort of deal, raise the floor of your offense, spend a little bit of money on a running back, which I usually don't advocate for. But I think Derrick Henry in this case is worth it. And heck, as Steven has pointed out many times, I'd rather prioritize Derrick Henry over some of the other guys who are in like that 12 13 million dollar range yeah uh we talked about derrick henry on the show if he's if they are looking in a, the expensive running back category i think that's my choice as well um alex insdorf your thoughts on the six players mentioned thus far and uh who would your three be yeah i'm still pretty against spending money on a running back but if there were to be one that I would spend money on, I think it would be Derrick Henry and just bringing him in and he's an immediate downhill running game fit. And it has, you know, as people have said, like really defied all age norms, right? So normally you'd be like, eh, you know, it's a running back over 30, but um, still forced a bunch of missed tackles last year, 1200 yards and is still an absolute freak show of back. So if they wanted to go in that direction, Although I would have my moral and ethical objections, uh, I would understand <laughs> why they would do that as opposed to other big name, big money running backs um, that they might go after. Yeah. Uh, so my three guys, uh, much cheaper running back. And as Katzen started with the UW Husky, I will start with a Rutgers Scarlet Knight in Gus Edwards. Um, I think it makes way too much sense. I mean, he, not only does he have familiarity with Ortiz, but also very familiar with Greg Roman uh, and being used in that system as well uh probably doesn't cost you more than the 3.75 million pff has projected for him uh and it doesn't preclude you from drafting another running back or even doubling down at running back in free agency if you wanted to go get uh, another guy say be it a zach moss or whomever um i think that that is probably the smarter way to build your running back room than going after one of the big uh, money running backs in free agency for linebacker, um, I went with Zach Cunningham of the Eagles. Uh, I think he's going to be pretty cheap. Uh, fits kind of the Minter scheme pretty well. Decent coverage linebacker. And frankly, they just need a body at linebacker right now. Um, you know, after cutting Eric Kendricks, I expect that position to be overhauled, you know, with free agency and the draft. So for me, I got to go with Cunningham there. Will become pretty cheap as well. Uh, and then my last one, will be uh, Lloyd Cushenberry of Denver. Uh, I think that they need to get a starting center here, whether it's him or Graham Glasgow, just because I think it would be tough to go into the draft and kind of handicap you if you force yourself to pick a center in the first four rounds. So having somebody who is at least starting caliber, even if on a shorter term deal, um, I think makes a lot of sense for the Chargers in this market. So I'd go with him. And then one last one I'll mention. I know I'm going on four. Um, I'll go with uh, CJ Gardner Johnson. If in the event that they do let Alohi Gilman walk, which mm -hmm. keeping Alohi Gilman is still my preference, 
Um, yeah. You know, he's still 26, a year removed from his best season uh, with the Eagles, formerly suffered a torn peck last year with the Lions, unfortunately, before coming back to the playoffs. Um, I think that he and Derwin would make a pretty good strong safety, free safety duo there. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good one for sure. I uh, Tyler told, stole mine. Obviously, we've talked about Colby Parkinson a lot, but the other tight end I'm interested in is Adam Troutman. Um, he's still younger on his existing contract, and you know he's probably a little more affordable than Parkinson, but I think he's you know not as good of a, a blocker or a receiver. But he would be one for me. And then uh, I'm interested in cornerback, and you know maybe kind of a you know, competent starter type, not necessarily like, you know, you're going to change the franchise here by any means, but Dane Jackson would be a cornerback I'd be interested in formerly of the Buffalo Bills. Um, he was actually tied with Marlon Humphrey and Greg Newsom this past season in terms of forced incompletion percentage at 19. He's played in the slot. He's played outside. Um, somebody who could at minimum compete with Asante Samuel Jr. on the outside you know, gives you some CB4, maybe CB2 kind of insurance, just a reliable, steady veteran that I think would make sense for them as well. Um, I wanted to pick an offensive lineman. I, I think Graham Glasgow makes a ton of sense for them, but I don't think he's like one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so I am going to go uh, full caricature of myself and bring up Zach Moss again. Um, one of the most efficient per play running backs last season. Um, in terms of yards after contact and missed tackles forced. That's always been in his bag. That's that's why he was drafted. That's why people liked him at coming out of the University of Utah. Um, it's just the the injury thing. So that's why he's not necessarily hit so far. I hated his fit in the Buffalo Bills, but the Colts, you know, really used him very well. There was one point in the season where he was like the leading rusher in the NFL. And again, just kind of stabilizing the position in a cost effective manner, I think would make sense in the same way as as Gus Edwards would. So all right, there's uh, 12, 13 free agents that we all like. Uh, guys, any other thoughts there before we start jumping into these questions? Nope. Let's get into them. Send in your questions, at least from my end. Uh, this was an interesting one here. Um, Anthony Hopper, I tweeted about Jeff mm -hmm. Okuda yesterday. Um, definitely not somebody that you are, are paying a lot, but uh, Mr. Alex Katzen, what would you think about a Jeff Okuda flyer for the Chargers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth considering um especially because it's probably not going to cost that much um again you're getting a guy who's going to play outside corner kind of push asante samuel um they don't really have a like defined cb2 on the roster we're kind of assuming that that's going to be a draft pick um and so i think that it makes sense um from a schematic standpoint akuda's best used is like kind of a more of a man corner um, you know, not going to be like a super zone heavy guy, um, kind of fits what the chargers are going to be doing with Minter. Obviously there's going to be a lot of disguise and stuff. And so like, you kind of want someone who's able to do both. Um, but it's free agency, especially if you're not going to be spending a lot of money, you're not going to get all around players, uh, a lot of the time. And so I think Akuda's worth taking a shot on. Um, you know, I think that, uh, the, the coaching in Detroit, uh, was not super, uh, well tailored to him. <laughs> um understatement what, i think <laughs> yeah and then um and then obviously like in atlanta um i i'm really high on on ryan nielsen as a defensive coordinator um but the the kind of infrastructure just around that team uh this season and and you know the whole time that he was there has just like not been super beneficial so i'd be more than willing to take a shot on him for sure yeah as would i i'm trying to look up his recruiting profile right now to see if Michigan. Oh, I'm sure he was recruited by Michigan. I mean, oh, he was recruited by everybody. I feel like, but I'm, I'm just curious if he ever got a an offer or anything. It's a it's a real bummer that his career has not worked out. He's he's one of my top four grades at corner I've ever given out, and uh, just landed in the worst possible situation for him. I yeah, I think he's still he's still only like what 25, something like that. I think he is about to turn 26, but yeah, mm. he's, he's still young. Yeah, no, still young and certainly for the money, wouldn't mind taking a shot on him. Notre Dame did offer him, though. Is um, Klinscale from that time? Maybe Minter? I don't know. No, that was early for Minter. Well, it's the... Uh, just turned 25 uh, in oh, February. Wow. So he's okay. young. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Alex... Let's uh let's discuss Josh Jacobs. I want you specifically because your moral and ethical <laughs> uh Alex Insdorf, that is, I'm talking about uh your moral and eth ethical objections. Why don't you make an argument for signing Josh Jacobs? 
Um, he led the league in rushing yards in 2022. Uh, he, you know, I, I think there's an argument that Josh McDaniels' system uh, and also the constant mess at Raiders quarterback last year kind of made Jacobs' numbers and production worse than it probably uh, was. So, you know, I think there's an argument that you have Herbert and you're rebuilding this offensive line that Jacobs has the opportunity to to be better next year if I'm playing devil's advocate with myself. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think you can make the case for it. But again, if if I'm not there with Derrick Henry or Saquon Barkley, I'm just kind of not there with spending that on Josh Jacobs. I get why they would do it, though, because it is an immediate upgrade over, you know, Eckler and, and kind of what they had last year. I'm just not sure that juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah. Um, Alex Katzen, do you have any thoughts on uh, Josh Jacobs? I would prepare for it to happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that's my thing about Josh Jacobs. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, while I was at the Combine, uh, I had two different people tell me that uh, the Chargers are huge fans of his um, and that they would expect – uh jacobs to be a charger once for agency opens um obviously that's going to cost a lot of money um i personally would not allocate my resources like that um but evidently uh like jim harbaugh is a huge fan of his um he has fans in the front office um i would as much as it pains probably most people that don't want to spend big money on a running back i would prepare for jacobs to be in powder blue uh this fall that's still so wild at this point. I, I think, man, I don't know. I, I get it because I just advocated for Derrick Henry, so I, I can't say like, oh, why that wouldn't make any sense. Um, he he is higher on than Derrick Henry on rushing yards that were expected per attempt, so at least there's that. But um, yeah, I, I could see it. I, I do feel like this offense, this team is going to lean a bigger name at running back. Obviously, Katz and her Jacobs, so we can lean Jacobs. Preferences Henry. But I would, I would get it. But I don't know, man. We'll see what that yeah. price ends up being. I think the thing for me is, you know, once we figure out what exactly they're going to do with Bosa, Mac, Williams, and maybe an extension of Allen, right? You probably are around like twenty-five to thirty million, maybe in terms of like money they'll have to spend. And yeah. I just think, you know, yes, they can sign him to a three-year, $33 million deal, as uh, PFF has him currently projected for. Um, but I just think that at this rate, that's you know a little bit tough to swallow with $18 million guaranteed. But also, I just think in terms of the financial flexibility they'll have, you know, if you're going to spend, you know, let's say seven to eight million of that cap hit uh, on Jacobs uh, of the 25 or 30 you have to spend with the amount of holes they have on defense. I just, I just think there are better uses of your resources. Yeah. I think the resources are, are, are tough. Maybe, maybe the depressed market at running back maybe brings that number down a bit here, but I, I guess, you know, if, if you're getting the 2022 version, which at this point is the outlier of, of his career, you know, if you look at his career arc, it's been kind of, if you remove 2022, uh you kind of are underwhelmed at the at the four years that the Raiders have gotten from him but if you look at 2022 he uh led the league in missed tackles forced that season obviously Alex mentioned total rushing yards but he had uh 90 missed tackles forced in 2022 in terms of yards after contact per attempt he was uh 11th in the league of those qualified at 3.40 um, explosive run plays in terms of 10 plus yards. He was second, only trailing Nick Chubb with 41. So if you're confident that like, hey, the 2023 Raiders offensive line was bad, the quarterback situation was less than ideal, um, you know, the play calling stuff with Josh McDaniels was not very good. If you view 2023 as an outlier, outlier and you view 2022 as the norm, then you're probably pretty fired up. And I can see why there would be fans of Josh Jacobs out there. Um, I think we all kind of agree that, you know, with where the Chargers resources are at, it's just that that's for me that I, I think you can make a real case for Josh Jacobs getting back to 2022 form in this kind of offense with Justin Herbert, with a better offensive line, with Greg Roman. It's just the money thing for me would have to be right. I, I could, I don't want to say live with, cause that's 
maybe a little bit harsh, but I think if you do like a three-year deal, low cap hit in year one and out after the second year, I could I could stomach it. I could live with it. I still would prefer Derrick Henry of the expensive running backs, but I think you can maybe get some more flexibility out of a, a three-year deal. And I think that's probably my preference of how you, you would go about signing him. Austin Eckler, explosive plays over 10 yards in 2023, seven. Josh Jacobs, explosive plays over 10 yards in 2023, nine. Yeah. 2023 was, it was bad. It was, it was not very good. So you're, if, if, if this happens and I know Alex Gadsden is pretty confident that it does, um, you are praying that you're getting 2022 Josh Jacobs and not 2023. Do you think signing a more expensive free agent running back means or indicates that they're going to lean into this identity with the fifth pick or eighth or 11th pick if they trade back and go with a tackle or Bowers or a guard and switch Zion to center or something? Or do you think they go with the opposite and say, okay, we got a running back. Now let's go get a Malik neighbors and kind of do something different on offense. Katzen, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, I think it means that I think that if they do that, it probably means that they are going to lean into it. Um, I think that it probably means that like they're going to focus on um, an offensive lineman or or defense even um, with either that fifth pick or if they trade down or, you know, whatever it is. Um, uh, I think that like they want to establish this identity very quickly and you know it's kind of a it's kind of a monkey's paw thing for for chargers fans right where it's like you know it kind of feels like the team has lacked an identity you know this entire time under with the brandon staley tenure and everything and now it's like okay all we want is like an identity as a football team and now it's like okay here is one and people yeah. are like no not like that not like <laughs> that. <laughs> no 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 no, no. Yeah. um and so I, I do think that it probably means that they will lean into it um with that first round pick um if not like you know, uh, early in the draft at least. Um, but obviously still a long ways to go. Um, and we'll just have to see what happens. Yeah. I think, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, uh, gave a scenario on his move the six podcast where the chargers trade down to, you know, 11, 12, 13, whatever. And, you know, a lot of people have been kind of linking them to a specific right tackle, which I would understand to a certain extent in a trade down, but he he was saying that his ideal scenario for them would be to trade down. You take Troy Fautanu from Washington, and he plays right guard for you as a rookie, and then right tackle after that going forward. So, Alex, as obviously the UW resident here, what are your thoughts about Fautanu playing guard and not tackle after kind of everybody kind of projected him as a guard, and then it was like, oh, he has 34 inch, 34 inch arms, so he's a tackle, and now it's kind of going back to he should be a guard right away. What are your thoughts there regarding? Fowtown and his fit to the Chargers. Yeah, I think that uh, he's a great fit for any team, really. I mean, he he can play guard or tackle. Um, I talked to him at the Combine, and he said that he's met with 28 teams, uh, and one of the four teams that he hadn't formally met with, with was the Eagles, which means that there's a pretty good statistical chance that he met with the Chargers. <laughs> um, just like there's only three teams out of the other 31 that he didn't meet with. And so like yeah. just doing the math there, like he probably met with the chargers. Um, but he also said that in all 28 of those meetings, uh, the teams asked him about playing guard. Um, mm. And so it seems like that is going to be at least something that the team that drafts him explores, uh, even if they stick him at tackle to start, obviously with the chargers, he's going to have to play guard immediately. Um, unless you think he's going to beat out Trey Pipkins and he's going to be a swing tackle for, nine million dollars or whatever it is um which doesn't seem like the best allocation of resources again um but i think that the plan of playing him at right guard at least getting him acquainted with like the footwork on the right side because he really only played left tackle at washington um and so moving him to right guard at least getting him acquainted with like the you know the speed of everything and like mirroring that foot uh footwork over to the right side and then next year if pipkins doesn't uh kind of take a step back forward um out of this kind of like regression that he had last season then it's a lot easier to get out of that contract you can slide troy over to right tackle and then like look at a guard um in next year's draft class or next year's free agency or whatever it may be um and so i think that that's a reasonable plan i think that that's much more reasonable to do with someone like Fatanu than someone like Joe Alt, who's six oh. foot nine. 
<laughs> um, so I think if that's the route that they want to go, Fatani makes a lot of sense. Um, Tylisi Fuaga makes a lot of sense. Um, guys like that that are kind of going to be more available in like the 11 to 15 range um, make a lot more sense to do that with. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. All right, uh, back to free agency here a bit. Uh, Ellie Bruin, what does the tender mean for Dicker? No team can match the contract or anything like that. Um, I'm still a little uh, confused on like the ERFA tag and what that means for him long term. Um, Alex Katzen was the one to break the news courtesy of over the cap. So uh, we can certainly talk about this. But um, fine, from a financial standpoint, why wouldn't you just like give him an extended contract? I know he was an undrafted free agent and all that, but I, I'm still kind of confused about the ERFA versus RFA versus UFA stuff. So anybody you want to clarify that, feel free, or you can just talk about how good Cameron Dicker is. I don't know. Cameron Dicker is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess I, I can take this one again, not to take over the episode or anything, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, so basically, uh, ERFA means like it's typically for undrafted free agents that sign with a team. Um, and basically what it means is that uh, no other team is allowed to negotiate with that player unless you specifically do not tender them. Um, you can sign them to an extension, but there's really no reason to, because if you pick up the exclusive rights for agency tender, the player is not uh an unrestricted free agent next season. They're a restricted free agent next season. So Cameron Dicker is going to cost $985,000 against the cap next season. He's going to be a restricted free agent, which means they can just tender him again next season. Um, and so while yes, he is probably deserving of a long-term extension and like the number on over the cap that says he's only under contract for one year probably gives people a little bit of anxiety because it's like, well, why won't we just lock him up long-term? it's a cost thing of like, why yeah. would we pay him two million, two and a half million dollars or whatever for like a top of market kicker extension when you can pay him $985,000. He may not even count as like a top 51 cap hit by the time things are all said and done, um, you know, on, on the 90 man roster. Um, and again, he's going to be a restricted free agent next season. And so like, I had a couple people that were like, Oh, you know, this is great. Like we'll lock him up long-term next season. I don't even think so. I think they're going to tender him again next season. And then he's going to be due to be an unrestricted free agent after you hit him with the restricted free agency tender. And then at that point next season, like next off season or no, not next off season, but the off season after next, then you give him the extension and you lock him up long term. Um, and it's just kind of like the way that the free agency is structured um, where it's like you don't need to pay him until two years from now. And so like, especially for the chargers who don't have a lot of money to begin with. <laughs> yeah. uh, like why would you pay him a top of market extension or like a, a pretty decently sized extension before you have to. Um, and like this happens a lot with kickers uh, and punters and like just specialists in general. Cause a lot of those guys come in as UDFAs and everything like a lot of kickers, punters, whoever, like you'll see like they're on extremely cheap contracts and you're like why are they on a vet minimum deal with no <laughs> guaranteed when they're like the fifth best kicker in the league and it's because yeah. they're on like an erfa tender or an rfa tender and so um he's gonna be on the chargers next season he's like there's no there's no question about that no one he's not like a it's not like restricted free agency in basketball where like you you know extend the tender to him and then teams are still able to negotiate with him he's gonna be on the chargers next year he's gonna be on the chargers the year after that um, and he's probably going to be on the charters going forward, um, unless something catastrophic happens, um, which it won't probably. Yeah. Cause he's really good. And Ryan Ficken's really good as well. <laughs> uh, Frank Blakely asking about Shadobi <laughs> Awuzie. Uh, he was at on the Bengals with a $7.25 million tag last season. Still with some injuries there, but Alex Insorf, uh, have you considered any potential fit there or is that maybe a little bit too expensive for corner for you? Um, it's a little pricey, but like I'm kind of of the mindset that the Chargers should spend on corner in this free agency. Um, you know, not just limited to Chidobe, depending on where he goes, but um, I happen to like Darius Williams a lot, who just got cut, and you know, uh, Joe, Joe Ortiz, he doesn't count against the cow pick formula, so there you go. Um, and then honestly, you know, basing this off of his 2023 performance, um, I honestly don't 
uh, mind Stefan Gilmore uh, either if, if the Chargers wanted to go in that direction. Uh, even though he's a little bit older, he is 34, um, you know, still has, you know, maintained great performance the last three years since leaving New England. And the Chargers just kind of need an identity right now at outside corner with guys that fit the system. So uh, for me, I think that any three of those guys are pretty decent choices. And I don't think you have to sign any of them to long term deals, as Arjun says in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Ronald Darby is a great fit to Rocky scene. I don't think you have to spend a bunch of money at corner and free agency, but I do think you at least need to get one guy who can play outside uh, in the draft or prior to the draft. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely agree. It, it's a must for the chargers real quick, just flipping to back to the previous point. Um, jo not Josh, Justin Tucker joined the league, joined the Ravens in 2012 did not get an actual extension until 2016, I believe, or 2017. Mm. So it, it took a while for them to, as Alex pointed out, like they cycle through the, the UDFA contract and the RFA contract. Then he got the franchise tag. Then he got an extension. Yeah, we just we got to get Cameron Dicker some uh, endorsements or something to uh, make up the ground here. You know, we got we got to do right by our guy and vote for him to the Pro Bowl next year. Right now, saying that get him to the Pro Bowl. Um, uh, let's get to our first super chat here again. Super chats appreciated. It will ensure that your question gets answered. Uh, from Gary, not a free agency topic, but how would you feel about trading down in rounds three and four? So maybe picks 15 to 20 in each round to get additional bodies in the draft. What are your thoughts there, Tyler? I mean, not opposed overall. What that nets you is maybe like a next year day three pick or something. It's not like you're going to get another third rounder this year or next year for that. But no, I'm, I'm not opposed. And Joe Hortiz and the Ravens have certainly done that. Second round, third round, whatever. Like they'll trade at any point to make it work. So uh, I'm not opposed. I think second round feels like a really good spot to trade down to, obviously at five. But the yeah. second round, there's so many players. If they're like, hey, in the second round, we're taking a wide receiver, you can trade down because there's 34 other guys you could take at that spot. Yeah. So the Chargers officially got their eighth pick, uh, courtesy of the Drew Tranquil contract. Um, it's the fourth to last pick in the draft i believe um so they they have eight picks to work with uh, i would like to see them get to 10 we'll see what kind of ways they go about doing that if you trade down from 37 to like the late 40s early 50s you can net an additional top 100 pick traditionally um so that that's kind of a more impactful trade down but you know George is going to play the board there at the top of every round which gives them some flexibility Specifically in round two and round four, you know, there's always these guys who kind of maybe slip through the cracks a little bit that teams kind of try and trade up for, um, like, you know, especially if like a quarterback that is there that people like, you know, I remember uh, the Saints traded up for uh, Jake Hayner on, in the fourth round a couple of years ago. So the Chargers are in a great spot to trade down in any round, but especially, you know, those those beginning of the days round. So first round, second round, fourth round, I think it will suit them well. And I would expect Joe Ortiz to uh, play the board that weekend for sure. Um, Garrick Norman wants to know what about Gus Edwards and DeAndre Swift? Uh, Alex, your thoughts on the uh, former Eagle? Uh, I like DeAndre Swift. He, I think PFS projection has him at like 6.25, which is, you know, a pretty mm -hmm. reasonable price for him. Um he was pretty good last year. I don't think he is going to be as uh, dynamic a runner as some of the guys at the top. And obviously he got the benefit of playing behind the Eagles line last year, which um, is very beneficial for running backs in the rehabilitation program. Yeah. Uh, but I do think there is still gas left in the tank there. Uh, pretty good between the tackles as it was last year. So I'm, I'm not opposed to it. And I certainly favor paying five or six million for him as opposed to uh, the running backs at the top. And then, like I said, I do think if you ultimately sign like a Gus Edwards or someone like that, that allows you a little bit more wiggle room to maybe go sign uh, another running back if you want to. And you essentially get, you know, two running backs for less than the price of giving out a 10 plus million dollar contract to one of the guys at the top. So uh, definitely not opposed to it. Steven, you had a discussion on Twitter about, I think it was Singletary, and how everyone's like, well, he had this stats and these stats and whatever the last couple of years. But your point was like, it doesn't really fit what they might be doing with the charge, what Greg Roman might want to do. So yeah. what are the charges looking for in a running back this offseason? 
Yeah, so in, in a gap and power scheme, uh, you're looking for a runner who's very decisive and can make people miss in a phone booth. You're looking for somebody who, whether that's physicality or you just, you know, lightning quick feet, but the vision and the decisiveness and the physicality are kind of like the traits that you're looking for. Um, Swift has been, um, I would say, better classified as a zone runner where you can kind of give him a longer runway out wide and in space, and then he can make a decision that way. He's not super decisive in in a vacuum, and he's he's better suited in space. So I, I think he worked for the Eagles because you had the draw of the Jalen Hurts run game. You had obviously the the offensive line. You had great tight end blockers. So I, I think it's it's probably a poor fit there too, unless like if you want Gus Edwards as well to do all the physical downhill stuff, that would make sense. But I think six ish million combined is is probably lowballing it. Um, I'm not opposed to DeAndre Swift and you could, you know, sign him to a $6 million contract. And then maybe you draft like a Braylon Allen or an Audric estimate to be your, your kind of your hammerhead. But I, I don't think you're investing that much money in the free agency running back position. You know, you could do like a Zach Moss and a JK Dobbins kind of deal. Um, you're probably uh, lowballing what these kind of guys are projected. I think Gus Edwards is currently like 3.75 million, but, um, to answer the question overall, like you're looking for a decisive physical runner who can get downhill in a hurry. And, and Gus Edwards obviously would would fit that bill. But I don't think DeAndre Swift would or Devin Singletary. Yeah, I also think that Gus Edwards definitely kind of fits it. There are a lot of running backs who would fit that downhill run scheme. DeAndre Swift, probably not the most optimal fit there. I wouldn't be surprised if they went for one of the more Roman running back like fits in the free agent market. And then also in the draft kind of get maybe like a Isaac Garendo who, you know, operates out of a lot of those outside zone concepts that, you know, Roman happened to like in Baltimore. Um, so I kind of think they could go in that direction in the draft too. maybe get more of your change of pace guy there, so to speak. Um, so that wouldn't surprise me. Somebody said Melvin Gordon in the chat. No, <laughs> but I appreciate the joke. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, or Jerry Tillery, who was cut today. Uh, poor guy getting cut twice by Tom Telesco. <laughs> That'd be funny. Um, Todd, Super chat from Todd Miller wants to know, can they not backload these free agency contracts this year, given the cap room in 2025 without over leveraging there? So I think the thing with the cap, specifically about free agents, is it's easier to backload contracts when you are adding years to the contract. So that's why, like Josh Jacobs, I think you could do that. But if you're talking about a short-term free agent, that makes it a little bit more difficult to backload the contract. Yeah, yeah. I also just don't I don't see them signing many like four-year deals in this free agency cycle. Right. <laughs> like they they don't they don't really have the ability to do that. They're gonna be signing one to three year deals max, like in the case of the projected contract for Jacobs. So um just don't really think there's an ability to do that. They can sort of probably do what they did with Kendricks last year, which was hey, get a small year one cap hit and then a big year two. But I think that's it. Yeah, I would agree. I'm curious how they structure contracts because they had given out so much guaranteed money the last few years. I'm curious if that changes at all with the new regime. I know they still have some guys in place from the previous regime, so I don't know if that's a one year thing now or what, but curious how that goes. Katzen, while I have you here, just because I want to ask, um, did anyone I don't because I don't know if this would have come up in any conversations you had. Did anyone discuss the report or the rumor, I guess, that Henry to the Ravens was ever a thing? Did that ever come up? Yeah, uh, it came up a little bit uh, while I was in Indianapolis. It wasn't really like a direct like uh, confirmation or denial of the rumor mm -hmm. ever, but it, it mostly came up in like conversations that I had with people who were generally pretty plugged in who were like, yeah, no, that just makes too much sense. There's no way that that's not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's kind of the the league wide expectation is that he's going to be on the Ravens. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily mm -hmm. because anyone has like heard anything or just because like it makes way too much sense for everyone involved. And so everyone looking from the outside in is just like, oh, yeah, well, obviously. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were chatting about Ray Davis before the, the show started and these running backs who are, you know, 23, 24 years old. Um, Katzen, where does Ray Davis fit for you in terms of like a potential Chargers fit and maybe some other day three running backs that you like? Yeah, I think that he's uh, a pretty decent fit for what the Chargers are going to be wanting uh, going to be wanting to do on offense. Um, obviously, Kentucky ran a pretty like downhill 
running attack um, behind him. Uh, their offensive line was pretty good. And so like that, that was kind of like their identity this season. Um, a lot of under center run, a lot of play action, um, a lot of stuff that you can see on film that translates well to like what the chargers are going to be expected to do under Roman. Um, for me, I think that Davis is probably going to land in that like fifth or sixth round range. Um, he is a little bit older. This season was kind of like his best year. Um, after a couple of pedestrian years between like temple and uh, I think he was at wake forest before um, he got to Kentucky. Um, and so he's a, he's a guy that I like. Um, I really wish that he wasn't 24. <laughs> um, he's a great story. He's a great kid by all accounts. Um, you know, I I'm a fan of his and I hope that he does well um, in the league. I just don't know if that's going to be um, like for the chargers necessarily, because again, with the, the um the rebuild and everything um like drafting a 24 year old running back that's you're probably only going to get the rookie contract out of like i don't know that that's going to be like something that they are looking for but again it's a fifth round fifth round sixth round pick so like maybe they're fine with that um because at the end of the day like that's pretty good value for a day three pick um some of the other guys i like in that range though uh kamani vidal obviously from troy has been someone that like i think that all of us have talked about a ton um yeah. he's one of my favorites um tiny dude but uh but he's awesome um garendo although i don't know that he's gonna be like a day three guy anymore um no he's like a 10 on res right now yeah and so i think he might sneak into the third round there like get into kind of like the the top end of the running back range um i think of who else um yeah those are my main guys i mean like fadal is kind of like my like locked in day three pick um i i love him he's awesome Insdorf, I know Vidal has your stamp as well. Uh, any day three guys that you like to? Yeah, uh, I, I'm big on Vidal, big on Ray Davis if it comes to that. Um, I'm trying to think of others off the top of my head, but those are definitely like my top two, I guess, uh, day three guys. And I think they make a ton of sense for what the Chargers are, are kind of looking for. I know uh, the Chargers met with uh, Vidal. Uh, I think at both the combine and the senior bowl. Is that true, Katzen? Yeah, I believe that's correct. Um, they met with Davis at the combine as well, if I remember correctly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they met with both of them. I, I think both of them are pretty good fits, especially if they get uh, a, a decently big running back. Like, you know, the reports think they are, you know, maybe going to angle to get one of those bigger signings. Then I think day three, you get your change of pace back um, more so than somebody like, a Braylon Allen who probably would project more for like a starting role. So I definitely think the doll Ray Davis, especially with how they're able to contribute um, both the running and the receiving game uh, make a lot of sense. Insdorf, how high are you taking uh, Blake Corum? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I think in, in round six, he's not, you know, not a terrible fit, you know, if you can get him there. But if he's in round six and Ray Davis is there, I'm taking Ray Davis. Oh, man. Where, where I will do say, we fall on Blake Corum? So I, I have him as a fourth round grade right now. Um, you know, I, I think that's what the film and the testing dictates, but it's just like, the injuries, the age, it makes it tough. And like Ray Davis and Garendo are older, but they don't have the injury histories and they don't have the tread because Blake Corum has been getting, you know, 300 touches a year for four years. So it just, it makes it tough. Like I know that there are Chargers fans and media members, like there's a good amount of the draft community that has him as RB1, which I think is, is a tad <laughs> rich for me. But I also think like the sixth round is probably a tad too low. <laughs> Um, I think the film and the great and the, the combine testing would dictate like a fourth round pick for me. I just, I would yeah. prefer other options that don't have the injury history and the age concerns. Yeah. yeah agreed. Um, I was just, I was just going to say, like, I think that certainly towards the end of this college football season, like he looked a little bit more like the Blake quorum of old, but still like, the guy did go from like fourth in yards after contact to 77th. You know, I yeah. do think there are moments like that and you see it on tape where he's just kind of a step slower. Um, I think if they get, you know, a big name running back in free agency and you want him as your change of pace guy, like I could eventually be sold into buying that. But, you know, I, I hope Harbaugh and Roman don't go into this with the expectation that like we're going to give Blake Corum like 200 carries a year. <laughs> like yeah. That would be 
kind of my hope, which if they are making the free agent moves that, you know, we sort of think they're making, then, you know, I, I, I guess that kind of makes a little bit more sense. Um, round three for Corum, though, with the amount of needs that they have on the rest of this roster, especially defensively, like that, that would be a little rich for me, um, especially if like Jalen Wright or somebody like that's still on the board. Yeah, speaking my language there, Blake Corum is, I think, what, second on the consensus board? He might be third now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like second round is a it, that's a no brainer. Like, no, you're not doing that in the second round with all their needs. Like, just no, no, no. Um, Katz, you were gonna he's second on the consensus board over like Benson and, and Brooks and those yes, guys. Yes, there there are a ton of draft yeah. community guys who have him as RB one. Like, it's it's uh, yeah. After the way that he tested at the combine, it became a much more loud take. Um, but. <laughs> There are a lot of it people became out there a much like, more loud take after five RAS. Like, what are we? <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing for you, dude. I I couldn't tell you why he's RB two. Um, yeah, he's RB two. It is seventy third on the board, so it's not like he's projected top thirty right. or something. But right. he is, yeah, ahead of Benson and everybody else. Brooks is RB one right now. Uh, Katz, and you were going to jump in uh, with a the thought there too. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I mostly agree with like what you said, Stephen. I think like fourth round is kind of where I'm comfortable with him, obviously with the injury history and everything else. But like he did pre test pretty well. I think he actually hit like a eight ish RS, um, which I was a little bit surprised by. Um, I do appreciate <clears throat> uh, other Alex's commitment to the bit there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think that that's really good. That's that's really funny. Um, but yeah, I think I think fourth round is probably ultimately where I'm going to land. I don't see rb1 rb2 uh like if you're talking about a fourth round pick i think it's going to be like rb7 um like there's a lot of guys that are going to go in that like third to fourth round range and i think it's just going to depend on like what teams are you know what specific teams are looking for i think like brooks benson like marshawn lloyd is going to be up there um jalen wright will be up there uh braylon allen will be up there despite like not testing at the combine and everything just because he's so young and he's like not got a ton of tread on the tires like large a lot of guys that are going to be up there and so i think that that is going to contribute a little bit to pushing quorum down as well um but yeah I, I think like fourth round is like where i'd be comfortable with him um and for the chargers like being at the top of the fourth i'm like if they're going to do that, I kind of would prefer, like we talked about earlier, like them trading down in the fourth, if they're going to do that, um, and taking it more towards like the middle of the fourth, later in the fourth. Um, but that's kind of where I fall on him as well. I'm yeah, curious, it's... Katzen, uh, where you think Bucky Irving goes after uh, the combine that he had? Because, I mean, me and uh, Steven were both pretty high on him. And now it's like, eh, you know, that testing was not quite what we expected. But, you know, if he's still there in like round five or round six, certainly wouldn't hate it. Um, but what is kind of the expectation there? Yeah, I think that the the kind of sense that I've gotten is that he'll be in like the fourth or fifth round. I think he'll be in kind of that like second tier of guys um, that get mixed in uh, in the draft. I think that his his testing was definitely subpar and it was under what people were expecting but i don't think it was like necessarily that far under what i was expecting like um you know like he looks like a pretty decent athlete on tape but he doesn't look like a like outstanding athlete by any means so i wasn't expecting like you know eye popping numbers from him or every, or anything i think that the biggest thing for him still is just going to be that he's under 200 pounds mm -hmm. um, and like typically the nfl does not really enjoy running backs that are that small um there's been a little bit of a shift of it uh this you know this past year with like devon a chain and um keaton mitchell but like mitchell was a udfa and then also got injured um a chan got injured twice um yeah. and so like i don't think that those players are necessarily going to change the nfl team's mind about like players that are that big um and so I think like fourth, fifth round range for him is going to be like where, where I ultimately land. I think he's going to be kind of like in that run that I think will get kicked off by a quorum or someone like that uh, kind of in the fourth that starts kind of a miniature run on uh, on running backs uh, kind of in that range. Yeah, uh, just to circle back to Blake Corum thing, I think the, the RAS was really boosted after the agility grades and the bench press in particular so we put up 27 reps on the bench press 
um, which is 98th percentile among running backs. And then he short shuttled 4.12, which is 90th percentile. And then three cones, 6.02, which is 95th percentile. So if you he just was at 5.8 like... before that stuff got added. So I'm going <laughs> to run with that. <laughs> I'm just saying the, the context there definitely matters there. Um, all right. Well, we'll move on to the next one here from Demetrius. Uh, how would you guys attack trying to pair someone with Thule on the other side for the future? through free agency or the draft tyler we haven't had done our edge rusher yeah so yet the expectation is still obviously that uh it sounds like the expectation i should say is that they move on from one of joey or khalil mm-hmm. so for you uh what how would you address the edge rusher position long term as demetrius is asking yeah i think it's too early to take an edge rusher early this year if they still have mac if they still have Tuli, there's your one two I think Hortiz, they do the the veteran free agent type. I'm not saying they have to go get Van Noy and Clowney specifically, but that worked for them last year. I think they do something like that. And then next year, should the opportunity present itself and Mac is going to be gone, that's probably just your round one target. You're going to take an edge rusher early. You should take edge rushers early. So I think you find a good third guy this year, assuming you move on from one of these, uh, one of Joey or Khalil. Um, and the next year you invest pretty early. Uh, Alex, is any other thoughts there? Um, yeah, I think the way you probably go about it depends on what you do with Bosa and Mac this year, obviously. Um, if you were to trade one of them and then you keep, let's say, trade Mac and then keep Bosa this year, which is kind of what like I outlined this morning, then I think in that situation, you could probably get off of Bosa next year. Um, you know, even do a restructure and free up some money that way uh, if they wanted to do that. So I think then you probably move off of both Mac and Bosa by next year. And then, yeah, like Tyler said, I just think, unfortunately, you know, I do think there's like some good edges in this class, but they just have too many other needs and are drafting, frankly, a little too high right now, unless they, you know, trade back significantly to like really take edge in the first round. Um so yeah, definitely kind of a next year long term like plan here, um, but still think yeah in free agency there's some great options uh, and they can go that route too. Yeah, agreed um, with everything there. I think that regardless of what order it happens in, Mac and Bosa are not going to be on the team in 2025, and so uh, you know like regardless of what order that happens in, obviously one of them is not going to be on the team in 2024. Um, but you're going to have one of them plus Thule as the one, two this season, like Tyler mentioned. I think they probably sign a three for like a pretty cheap deal in free agency. Um, you still have, you know, some of the young guys that they cycled in uh, this year under contract for next season to kind of like add depth um, and then like attacking it more aggressively in the draft uh, next year, um, whether that's like the round one pick or like another like round two pick like Tuli was um, to then replace the second of those big two guys that are going to be exiting the team after next season. Um, I think that that makes the most sense um, from a long-term perspective. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think the only real scenario where I could see the Chargers being like aggressive at edge early in the draft would be, you know, you trade down to 11, and then somebody comes to you again with like a an, another package, you know, you trade down twice to like 15, 16, 17, and Jared Verse or Dallas Turner, Yatu Latu are still there, and they're like very clearly the best players on the board. So I think it would have to be a bit like I really like Jared Verse, and he would be a pretty natural replacement for Khalil Mack. Um, but I'm probably not comfortable taking him until, you know, like 12 or so after that given the the cornerbacks that I think are higher than him, Taron Arnold, and I'm not 100% sold on Quinion Mitchell, but I'm not taking verse over, tar- over Arnold for sure, and uh, depending on the wide receiver board too. So I think there's like a slight chance, but I would tend to agree with what has been uh, said in terms of probably attacking that position more aggressively next year. Um, I see you answered this in the chat, Tyler, but uh, – any thoughts of from the other three about Mohamed Kamara from uh, Colorado State, correct? Yeah. Um, he's fun. I, I really like him. I got a chance to see him live at the Shrine Bowl. Um, really stood out there. I think was probably the best edge rusher that was down there in Frisco. Um, the thing for him is just going to be that like he is small. Um, six, one like and a half, six, 48, yeah, yeah. like sub 33-inch arms. 
uh, 78 and a half wingspan. Um, so teams are typically not like super high on guys like that. Again, it kind of goes back to that conversation that we were having about Bucky Irving. Um, and so like body type wise, it's going to be, uh, a process with him. I think, um, I don't necessarily think that he's like a bad run defender on tape, but like, you're always concerned with guys that are that size, um, like how they're going to run defend in the NFL. Um, that's going to be a point of emphasis for the chargers. Um, and so I like, I like him. Uh, I think he's going to be a pretty decent NFL player. I just don't necessarily know if that's going to be for the chargers. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's kind of where I, I fall to. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I haven't gotten much of a chance to watch him yet. Um, like if I'm, I'll, tease my mock draft a little bit but smaller edge that i kind of like a little bit more later in the draft uh, i do like khalid duke out of kansas state uh, right. a lot and i know katzen's a kind of big fan of him too but i definitely think there's room in general for like a fifth to seventh round like flyer even if they're not going to probably be addressing edge particularly early in this draft yeah that's fair all right, guys, we'll uh, take questions for a few more minutes here. We'll d- do some fast ones. Uh, it, I guess this is the time of the show where you ask a food question food. if you want. Of course, got to get the food question, question or whatever. <laughs> uh, but we'll do some rapid ones, and then uh, we'll head out for the day. Wanted to circle back here from Anthony Hopper. Uh, thoughts on Devin White and or Julian Blackman? I have no thoughts. Devin White is going to cost a lot of money for the player that he is because of what his name is. And because he was a first-round <laughs> pick. And he's not. Wasn't he benched by the Bucks? Yes, he got benched for a UDFA this season. Yeah. Oh. But he's fast. Julian Blackman is sick, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love Julian Blackman. Probably going to cost too much money for the Chargers. Yeah, uh, Julian Blackman, obviously another Utah guy. So I was letting somebody else talk about him first. <laughs> um, he played a lot of slot for Gus Bradley this past year, so there's there's a lot of flexibility there. He was all Pac-12 as a corner, and then all Pac-12 as a safety. So he could do a lot of different roles for you, depending on like what kind of needs you have. I actually do think he would be a, a pretty good fit for the Chargers. Him and Derwin can kind of just like change places all over the place, and and you wouldn't necessarily lose a lot. There is an injury history there. A lot of the Utah guys, unfortunately, get injured a lot in the NFL because I don't know why it sucks, but um, definitely not opposed. I think he's projected by Brad as like a six million dollar per year candidate right now, if I believe, but. There's a ton of quality safeties this year in terms of uh, veteran options for the Chargers. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, Joseph Rodriguez, if you could pick what, just one Wolverine, who would it be and where? I think for me, it's Junior Colson. I think yeah. the, the hype for him right now is kind of like in the 50 range. So I don't know if he'll make it to the, th- into the third round, but that would be... That would be awesome. I think Junior Colson is is the perfect, you know, like linebacker in this system. Obviously, he played very well in it. Um, so him in the third round would be my ideal scenario, but I don't know how realistic it is that he makes it to pick number 69. Yeah, that's what I'm praying for. So just looking at the mock consensus board, there's 18 players from Michigan yeah. uh, projected in about the top 300 or so. So, yeah, good group for sure. Colson would have been my pick. I don't feel like I have to go get Jenkins in the second round. Sainra still, that's up to them to answer that question based on what Derwin's going to do. We feel a certain way about Corum. Um, Steven, honestly, I like Trent Jones, the tackle from Michigan, who played like, oh, yeah? We started like three games. And we joke about this every year at this point. And we just made the joke in the last episode that we never like the Michigan <laughs> offensive tackles because they're always guards and they're they don't guards, do well. Yeah. Um, he might also be a guard, but I actually finally, for the first time in my life, Watched a Michigan tackle and thought, eh, it's not bad. <laughs> All right. There we go. The Harbaugh effect. The Harbaugh effect. <laughs> um, yeah. Matson or Insler, if you want to answer that one. I think for me, I've thought Junior Colson throughout the whole process. Um, like Tyler said, Sainer still, I think, is the best like possible player, I think, in that range that they could take. Um, but it comes down to, do they want Derwin playing the slot? Do they not want him playing the slot? Um, and then I think if they don't, then I think that becomes a much more possible option, but also kind of depends on what they do in free agency because St. Ristol's probably still a slot only guy and you still don't really have like a true outside like bona fide major corner. So I think that's a little bit of an interesting fit depending on how they decide to fill corner like throughout free agency and the draft. 
Um, I would say St. Bristol is probably the best player that I would, you know, like out of Michigan, but I would also say the like smarter pick in terms of fit is probably Colson. Yeah, Colson's my pick too, but like uh obviously Colson, St. Bristol, still like guys that you touched on. Um I do want to uh mention like AJ Barner, uh the tight end is another one who I like quite a bit. He's going to be a day 3 pick, um probably like 4 5 6 range. Um but as like a tight end two, um is just going to be asked to block was basically what he was asked to do at Michigan. Um I think he fits pretty well. Um and then uh Cornelius Johnson the receiver is a player that I like a lot. Um mm-hmm. I don't know that he's going to be a great fit for the Chargers because I think that Michigan didn't really like use him properly. And uh, I talked to him at the Shrine Bowl and like uh, I asked him, you know, about like, hey, like you're doing a lot of like different stuff than you did at Michigan. Like, what's the deal with that? And he kind of he gave a very diplomatic answer, but it was kind of like (laughs) I think that he kind of feels that way, too, a little bit. And so, like, I don't know that that's going to be like a, a great Chargers fit, but he is a player that I like a lot, um, like in the fourth or fifth round as kind of like a discount um, wide receiver option. Yeah, his testing was like identical to Nico Collins too, like measurements, yeah. everything. So Yeah, that's a confidence been floating around too, is just like uh, like a guy that could like, you know, get to your two or three and then just like blow up because like a, a team is uh, using him correctly. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, Mel Kuyper and Field Yates at the over-under for the Chargers drafting Michigan players at 2.5. I'm taking the under. I don't think it'll be that many. Like, I could see two. Like, I could see Colson in round three and A.J. Barner, like, later on. But I people are getting a little crazy, I think, with, like, the Michigan stuff. Like, I, I don't think he's just going to take all the Michigan defensive players and say, come back to play with me again. Well, yeah, of course, the draft is going to start with at JJ McCarthy at five. I mean, you know, how much Harbaugh's <laughs> talked about him, obviously. So let's hope so. Obviously not to the chargers, but uh, that'd be great. Yeah, agreed. I, I'm going to take the under there. Um, I think that it's been overstated um, for sure. Like uh, there are enough people in the front office. Um, and this is something that I think we've talked about before, but like Joe Ortiz is like, was a like pretty well thought of GM candidate. Like you don't take this mm-hmm. job if you're just going to like, defer your entire like <laughs> responsibilities to Harbaugh and and what the Michigan staff wants yeah. um and so like I'm I'm gonna take the under there I'm gonna I'm gonna trust that like you know there's there's gonna be um scouting process that goes on um <laughs> I do think that like if there's a tie and people are split on a pick that they're gonna mm-hmm. lean towards a Michigan guy like if he's in consideration um but I do think that like if there's some of these guys that like hit UDFA range, um, that like they'll probably end up chargers. Yeah. But those aren't going to be players that are drafted. So I'm going to take the under on two and a half. I would also take the under. Yeah. Interesting. Super chat question here from Todd. Big if, if Marvin is on the board at five, is there a realistic trade package that you would accept? Uh, and how far down, what would the package be? Kind of, kind of question here. <sighs> I'd have to consider Define who's trading it, I guess. Consult the trade pick chart, Tyler. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I, well, let's say it is kind of the same out of the top 10. So you get someone second this year and maybe another pick next year. It's not for a quarterback if they're trading up for Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, so let's say you get a second this year and some other pick next year. I'm not trading out of that. No, I... If so, theoretically, this would be like quarterbacks go one through four, obviously, or Connor Rogers thinks that the Cardinals could take Joe Alt, which would be hilarious to me. But um, I approve. <laughs> I approve. <laughs> so those are the, those are the two scenarios. If Marvin Harrison Jr. is on the board at five, I, if he's there, I'm not trading down. I'm taking him. Like I think he's the best player in the draft. Like there's, you'd have to offer me like at minimum a first round pick next year for me to even consider moving on or moving away from drafting Marvin Harrison Jr., I think. Yeah, I think that if you're going to trade off of that pick, it has to be for a package that is essentially a quarterback package. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I was just looking uh, at what the Julio Jones trade was, and that was two ones, like a a swap to get to 27-6, but also a future one, a two and two fours. But that was also to move down 21 picks. Yeah. Yeah. and so, but I think that that's kind of the framework that you'd be working off of, uh, is like, uh, a one next year 
probably getting a two from someone and then like a day three pick either this year or a future year, which at that point is basically a quarterback package. Um, and so I think that that would have to be what it is um, in order to move off of something like that. Now, I am not the GM of the Chargers, unfortunately. So I think that like if this scenario does happen, I think that there is probably a realistic package that they accept that is less than that um because of what they're trying to build and everything um but me personally like it has to be a one this year like you know moving down a one next year uh probably a two this year and a day three pick next year and yeah you- i was just gonna say um i mean i don't think marv's gonna be there anyway i think he's probably yeah, going to the cardinals or patriots yeah. um really depends on, I guess, how differently they have Marv versus Neighbors versus Odunze graded. Like, if they have Marv Mm -hmm. a decent tier above those guys, then, like, yeah, on, you know, kind of, I I don't think you trade out of that. Um, But if you can, like, get back to, you know, that nine range and maybe you wind up with whoever is left between Neighbors or Odunze and you don't have them graded that differently or like certain sections of Chargers Twitter, you just think Marv is an overrated Nepo baby, then uh, in that (laughs) instance, in that instance, okay, fine, you can trade back. But uh, I think Marv is the best receiver in this draft, as Stephen just said, and um, I I would just be kind of devastated if they, you know, traded out of the best possible you know, receiver that they could have gotten in any of the last five drafts and did it because their roster was poorly constructed before and they felt the need to do that. But I also don't think that would be the case. I think if they traded out of that pick, then they would feel pretty comfortable with whatever wide receiver they would take in the first round or they would be comfortable with the depth of the class and maybe there's some type of resolution that they can get on Mike Williams or something like that too. Yeah, man, I, I I would have such a tough time on draft night if Marvin Harrison Jr. is on the board at five and they did not take him. That would be that would be not fun for me. Um, <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, guys, this has been awesome. I appreciate uh, Alex and Alex for jumping on here. Um, the floor is yours for any final free agency take uh, before we jump out of here. So, Alex Inzer, we'll, we'll start with you final free agency take before we get to the opening of the new league year next week is what please don't spend 10 million dollars on a running back <laughs> you I can really... spend 9 million <laughs> uh, i don't know if that's the smartest thing either um you know i just think going into free agency the goal should be filling out some of these roster spots that you know you just don't want barren going into the draft um, you know, particularly center sticks out to me, corner sticks out to me as, you know, some of those positions, uh, even linebacker. Um, so I think definitely you should be going kind of for more of the bargain bin value uh, and maybe some of those tier two, three, four free agents than some of the tier one guys. Um, that would certainly drive more buzz on Chargers Twitter. But uh, I, I definitely think the smarter thing is to kind of play the value game in free agency. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of my thing going into this week is spend smart not more uh in this case especially considering the contract situations that the chargers are in i do want to say uh whatever happens uh this week love mike williams and uh everything he's done uh, as a charger has been awesome so you know i hope they figure out you know some resolution there that kind of works out for both sides um but he's been an awesome charger to watch yeah, I see Tyler pulling it up. Uh, I'm glad we stayed on here for a minute because Deanna Rossini just tweeted out that the Chargers are open to trade offers for many veteran players, including Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, per her sources. There are teams interested, but many around the league are willing to wait to see if the Chargers cut them soon. Uh, and any takes there? I mean, to be expected, pretty much. Um, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think that that's... <clears throat> excuse me um i don't think that that's really like a surprise by any means um obviously uh i still think that it's more likely that khalil is back than joey but if you're getting a better trade offer for khalil than you are for like if you're gonna get something substantive back for khalil then like it's probably uh you know a decent move to trade him and keep joey um you know, but I don't think that's a surprise, really. Like many veteran players, I would assume means Khalil, Joey, Mike, 
uh, end of list. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> you know, so it, it is what it is. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily like a huge surprise. Um, I, I do think that like the team's willing to be patient and see if they just end up getting cut kind of lines up with everything that we've talked about all off season as well. Yeah. Um, where like, Hey, like you have to get cap compliant by Wednesday. Like there's a time limit on, right. <clears throat> on this, like we can just wait this out because you have to get rid of one of them. Like yeah. you can't keep all three of these players going into Wednesday. One of them is going to be off the team. Um, and so I think that there, if there is a trade that gets done, it's going to be either that like a team gets wind that like the Chargers are planning on keeping the guy that they want, whether that's Khalil yeah. Lee or Mike or whoever it is. Um, and they're like, Hey, no, no, no. Like give him to us. Or they get the sense that like, they're not going to be players in that market if the player hits free agency, right? Where like if Joey hits free agency and it's, you know, whoever it may be, um, and then they're like, oh, like, we're not going to be, like, in the market for him as a free agent, so we have to trade for him if we want him. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it doesn't change a ton for me. Um, I think it's still pretty much, like, what we expected. It's going to be business as usual. I'm interested to see if they get back anything, um, and if so, what it is. But, um, yeah, I think to be expected. Tyler, you were going to jump in there? No, I think Alex okay. said it perfectly, so I'm I'm good there. Yeah, yeah. I just I wanted to say, with the Joey and Khalil stuff, uh, kind of like Katzen said, I I don't think that they're going to have a ton of leverage. And this is something I think Brad wrote about uh, a few weeks ago in PFF when he kind of projected like a 2025 fourth, you know, potentially for Khalil Mack uh, in a trade back. And it's just mm -hmm. like, I don't think the Chargers have a ton of leverage. Um, to be able to exercise some of these trades. I'm sure they would love to trade Khalil Mack or Joey Bosa. It's just, does it come to fruition? I will float the San Francisco scenario only because, you know, I mean, Popper talked about it, but also they are a team that just got armed with three uh, comp picks yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, if, if the Chargers and Joey decided, hey, look, you know, it's time to part ways, that I think is like the one route that seems the most convincing for Joey Bosa. And then I think either way, depending on how they split the Bosa Mac thing, you're probably talking about some of those like Detroit, San Francisco, you know, playoff contenders that are trying to beef up their pass rush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to all of the free agency podcasts this week and all of them talked about the 49ers, maybe making a big play for some defensive free agent to kind of, you know, get back to their previous form. So I, I I wouldn't rule that out. I think to me, a lot of people debate like who has more value, Joey or, or Khalil. I still think it would be Khalil just because Joey has all of the injuries. He has another year on his contract that's still relatively expensive. So I just don't know, like Alex Insor said, like how much value there is in either of them. So my expectation is that Mike Williams is cut. I, I think especially after the Jerry Judy trade where the Broncos get a fifth and a sixth round pick, like, Nobody's really going to trade for Mike Williams coming off of that ACL injury. So I would expect him to get cut and one of the edge rushers to get traded. I, we'll see kind of how that unfolds. But technically speaking, they could cut Mike Williams, make another extension restructure and hold on to the edge rushers. But uh, we'll see what happens there. But either way, this team is going to look very different. Like Alex Insor said, Mike Williams, uh, Joey Bosa, Austin Eckler, all these guys have been you know, pillars of the franchise for the last six, seven, eight years. So it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of big changes on this team. And uh, we're going to have all of it covered. Alex and Alex, we appreciate you guys for jumping on. Thanks to Tyler, as always. Thanks to you guys for all the great questions, all the great super chats. That's going to do it for us today. We'll see you next time. As always, Bolt Up.